Humans don't tend to think about themselves as vulnerable people. And yet, you get sick, you lose a loved one, there's a natural disaster, you suffer a war, all these things happen, and we know that they happen. It's a part of life. As you get older, you realize that you can't control the world. The only thing you can actually control is yourself and how you respond. And through your heart and your mind, how you plan for what comes next. In the first part of my adult life, I approached these questions as a writer and then, as Lakshmi said, joining the Pentagon and working in national security planning during the Obama administration. And I entered the Pentagon focused on counter-extremism. I'm a child of the post-9-11 generation, very much shaped by what Al-Qaeda did. And I went in, and I soon realized that in addition to nuclear weapons proliferation or terrorism, we also had the internet. And within it, the data centers and servers and all the components that power the internet, that power the global economy, they were vulnerable. They were vulnerable to manipulation from the outside. All of the photos you have, all of your personal identifiable information, all the cat memes that you've downloaded that you've forgotten to delete out of iCloud, all the photos that you wish you deleted that you then shared with your friends, all those things are in data centers or in a cloud environment. Not only that, but data centers power things like satellites and they power the electric grid, and they power the banking system, and all of the critical infrastructure that enables human life, right? And these things are vulnerable. We know that they're vulnerable, and there can be significant consequences if somebody intervenes and manipulates them. For example, in 2015 and 2016, Russia broke into the electric grid in Ukraine and shut off power for a couple of hours. And of course, as we all know, Russia intervened in the 2016 presidential election hacking into Gmail and altering how Americans perceived uh, the narratives surrounding politics, which ultimately undercut democracy. These are significant consequences. And what I want to talk to you about today is, within the international security landscape, you have to assume breach. Our data centers and cloud environments are today quite insecure. And if you assume breach, if you imagine that someone is going to break in, if you imagine that you're vulnerable, then that changes how you think about security. And ultimately, for all of us, all of our countries and our societies all over the world, if we assume breach, that becomes our mantra, and we then have to secure our critical infrastructure in our society so that we can become secure beyond breach. And that's the place that we want to get to. And if that's where you're trying to get to, then what you're thinking about actually are best practices in cyber resilience. So if you start as the individual, as a person who who encounters a disruption, as a person that has to be resilient to change, then our societies need to become resilient to breach. So this can all sound very abstract for non-cybersecurity people, I'm aware of that. So I'm gonna put up a potentially confusing slide. Who here has heard of the Office of Personnel Management in the United States? Let's see a, a show of hands. Okay, that's three people, good. So this is one of the smallest agencies within the US government, right? But it also happens to house all of the personally identifiable information of the entire US government workforce, including all of, your, all of the security clearance information you have to fill out something called an SF-86. It's like 70 pages long if you've lived in multiple countries in the way that I have, and you have to put in all your data about everyone you know, right? Now, in 2015, the Chinese, it was recently disclosed a few weeks ago, it was attributed to the Chinese, they mapped the network of the Office of U.S. Personal Management, and they penetrated the network, and they made their way to the crown jewels, and they stole the data for 21.5 million Americans and all their personally identifiable information, right? So let's do a quick look at the anatomy of what, what happened here. During a breach, when somebody breaks in, they'll usually start with a server that's sort of low-hanging fruit. I like to think about this as if you put on your David Attenborough voice, this is like the weak antelope at the end of the herd if you're watching a Discovery Channel video. It's like the trailer, it's the weak, it's sick, it's the easy one for the lion to pick off, right? So the intruder will grab that server, and then they'll start mapping the interior of the data center. And in this instance, the Chinese made their way under that thing called the jump box. And that then allowed them to gain access to the 21.5 million. And this is because the data center was insecure within the interior. So obviously it's not a very resilient scenario for one of the most important organizations that houses some of the most important data in the United States. So what does it mean to assume breach? If you assume breach, it means taking on an adversary mindset. It means thinking about what does the adversary really want? Have I secured that most important piece of data my crown jewels for my organization. Now, within the federal government, you would naturally think that 21.5 million people within the Office of Personnel Management would be incredibly important. 
But you'd be surprised how many organizations don't think about their most important missions and how that data relates to their most important mission. So the first thing, if you assume breach, is to take on an adversary mindset. The second thing is you need to take a hard look at who you are. You need to say, not only what are my most important missions, but where can I afford to spend money? Where can I afford to really drill down on the most important data and the most important missions and try and secure it? What can I let go? Like maybe you can let go of the marketing department. I often work in the marketing department. I can tell you I don't have access to the most important information around like key data in a company, right? Maybe you can let go certain, some parts of your organization don't need to be as secure as the others. And then the last thing you need to do is you need to, be, you need to prepare for losing something that you value. That's actually a very hard proposition, right? You need to be prepared. You may lose three servers, but you can't lose all 3,000 servers. So you have to secure the ones that you can and be ready to let go of those in some instances that you may have to. So that's what it means to assume breach if you take on that notion significantly. These are actually quite uncomfortable premises. And it gets back to that point about vulnerability. If you assume that you're vulnerable, then you have to begin to think this way about the institutions that you would hope would be so secure. And why is this so significant? If you assume breach, this means preparing for what you could call high consequence risks. In recent times, we've seen a few. 9-11, as I mentioned earlier, the global financial crisis, or recent elections, surprise elections that come out of nowhere. These are things that alter the trajectory of nations and the trajectory of society. This was written about first by a man named Anthony Giddens, who was the head of the London School of Economics in the 1990s. He wrote a beautiful book called The Self and Modernity. And his argument was that urbanity, technology, and global interconnectedness make us more susceptible to attacks by a smaller group of people, which means Al-Qaeda, or it means a very well-resourced group of hackers within a nation state who can be on salary and spend money and time, they have time because they work for a nation state, and they can use these vulnerabilities inherent in urbanity, globally interconnectedness, and technology to manipulate a society, right? That's where we are today. When he first wrote, the internet was at about 300 million people in the 1990s. Today, this is where we are, 3.8 billion people. That number might have gone up to 3.9 since this morning. I don't actually know. But obviously, back in the day, if you were a Navy in say, Australia, and you wanted to attack somebody in Alaska, you had to cross the ocean with a ship. Not anymore. Now you can use all the connections of the internet to enable an attack. How old is the internet? It's 35 years old. That's the exact same age as Thor, right? For just a sense of scope. Like when Chris Helmsworth was born, that's when TCP IP was created. I think they were both born in January. Also, Nicki Minaj, she's about the same age. What's the lesson here? The internet is extremely young. They're not extremely young, they're not as young as a five-year-old, but they're young people. So we went from zero in 1980, whatever year it was, to 3.8 billion in 35 years. Can you imagine? That's remarkable. And in, in the next five years alone, between India and China, we're going to add another billion. So in 35 years, we got to 3.8, and the next five, we're going to add another billion. Can you imagine what this is going to do to society? It's going to change it in ways that we cannot imagine. So, let me offer you two propositions. So when I worked in the Pentagon, starting in 2009, we launched this organization called U.S. Cyber Command. Who's heard of U.S. Cyber Command? I think that's one person. That's terrific. So I'm offering you, um, I'm offering you some good news. So this is an organization that's responsible for defending the United States against cyber attacks of significant consequence. If you assume breach, the first thing you need to prepare to do is to defend forward in cyberspace. That means that a highly resourced nation state will be trying to break into your networks from the outside. And given that we haven't imposed significant costs on those countries, we've, for example, from the United States standpoint, we've indicted Chinese, we've indicted Russians, and we've indicted Iranians. We've also sanctioned all three countries for cyber attacks, which means we've imposed economic sanctions on them. What we have not done is publicly declared or necessarily conducted a counter-offensive cyber action against the individuals who are conducting an attack against the United States. But one of the propositions is if you assume that you're going to be breached, if you assume you're vulnerable, you must be able to impose legal, justifiable costs on an adversary to prevent them from doing what they're doing. That's how you control escalation in cyberspace and prevent a conflict from spinning out of hand. So that's the first proposition. You have to defend forward. The second thing is you need to become secure beyond breach. And that's where it gets into some very technological functions and also analysis of leadership, organizational change, and management. And that's what I want to spend the rest of our talk talking about. 
So I would argue that we have been in a, a, a pre-9-11 mindset when it comes to cybersecurity. What does that mean? Before 9-11 in the United States, all you needed to have in order to enter the country was a passport. If you had a passport, you could get in and you could go anywhere. The cities were not secured. There were no counterterrorism units in the police departments. There were no pylons outside of, outside of large buildings. There was no Department of Homeland Security. So essentially, once you made in through the perimeter, the interior was open to you. Obviously, that's changed. And in cybersecurity, that's what we would call the old security stack. Who here knows what a firewall is? That's a larger number than anyone who knows what the Cyber Command is or the Office of Personal Management. That's good. So within the old security stack, you have a firewall. That keeps bad traffic from coming into your network. It filters, it sets policy for what can come in and what can't. You also have uh, encryption, which was created back in the day. How many of you encrypt your emails? OK, you need to start doing that. How many of you en encrypt your hard drives? OK, okay there's some, a lot of room for improvement. How many of you use multi-factor authentication? OK, I'm seeing more hands. That's good. So multi-factor authentication, you could call the middle-aged security stack. It's more recent. Firewalls, encryption, intrusion detection systems, and monitoring systems, those are the older parts of cybersecurity. They focused on keeping, on securing the perimeter and keeping someone out. Multi-factor authentication does the same thing. It secures the user to try and prevent an attacker from breaking in. That's very important. So when, you're, when, you're, when you go back to your organizations, when you go home, when you talk to your people about the investments that they have to make to secure their organization, you move through what's called the security stack. And you have to have the old stack to protect the perimeter. And you also have to encrypt and do all the things that none of you are doing, right? But then you also have to secure yourself from the inside. And that's where the security community has evolved in the last few years. You have the uh, GDPR, which is Europe's new law about breach management. You have new breach, breach management laws in Colorado and California, which mandate that if there's a breach, you have to prove that you've controlled the breach or, or that, you've taken the, that you've taken the necessary steps to remediate the breach or that you invested in advance to control the breach from happening. These are new laws. These are changing laws. There is an evolution going on in cybersecurity. There's a push and a pull between the technology community, which is often in California and the United States, and the policymakers in Washington, D.C., to try and arrive at this place of managing breach and preparing to secure data centers from the inside out. And that's where I'll talk to you about Microsegmentation, which is what could be described as the last layer of the security stack. Remember the Office of Personnel Management that I talked about in the beginning. You got the first, you got the weak antelope server, right? The sick antelope, the young, whatever, put on your David Attenborough voice. That's the weak server. Once you get in, you get six, three to six months on average once you break into an organization to dwell inside of it. This is what it looks like if you have a, a, a submarine that's been segmented. If there's an intrusion, if water breaks into part of the hull, you close the doors. You stop the water from spreading. The same thing's true for your, for your servers. Right now, this is what it looks like for most data centers on the left. That didn't work out for the first inventors of the submarine, if you know your history, in like the 1930s. The first subs went out, the water came in, the thing went down. The Titanic was not segmented as, much, as well as it should be. One hit in the hull, the whole thing sank. Just like our data centers today. So what micro-segmentation does, is it sets policy for how your applications and your servers interact with one another. There's a whole bunch of different companies that are doing it, including mine, but it sets these policies so that if and when an intruder breaks in and gains access to three servers, there's policies that will alert the, the security operations center so that they know the intruders on the inside and they won't be able to move laterally. This is what it means to become secure beyond breach. This is what it means. You have to recognize the vulnerability of your organization and of yourself and you have to invest to make yourself secure going forward. But the most important part of the story, the most important part of our cybersecurity story and the assumed breach narrative is changing the mindset of leaders. Right? We're now at a point, US Cyber Command was created in 2009, the internet was created 35 years ago. We have seen enough breaches from the Office of Personnel Management to Target to the intervention in the US Democratic election to know that bad things happen in cyberspace. Leaders have now changed their minds. So what are three principles in closing for how leaders can move, move forward in cybersecurity? First thing is you have to elevate someone within your organization to a significant leadership position. In Cyber Command, it was originally a three-star. The position was elevated to a four-star, four-star general, who now has significant command and control authority. The second thing is you need analysis. 
that leader needs to build a command and control organization and develop the teams necessary to manage cybersecurity within the organization. But you need good analysis to look at that organization and say, is it working? Within the Office of the Secretary of Defense, we had an organization called Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation. And they would constantly analyze Cyber Command to say, are our dollars going to good work? Are we achieving the effectiveness we need to? And if you assume breach, you have to take an intrusion all the way from the beginning, all the way to the end, and say, have I prepared for this? And you have to prepare for failure. You have to be able to fly your ships, sail, fly your planes, sail your ships, even after comms have been disrupted. And then the third thing is you need to invest in technology. You need a smart person who can help you develop and identify what that technology is. The good news is, and I want to leave you with like a very strong sense of good news, after 10 years, we've seen a massive evolution. Some of the best talent in the world is now moving to cybersecurity. The current head of US Cyber Command, I knew him when he was a colonel almost 10 years ago. He's brilliant. He grew up in the field. So you should all be very hopeful, and you should urge your children and your grandchildren and all of your cousins and whoever to enter the field, because there's an incredible amount of people that are going in, and the world needs you. Thanks very much. <laughs>